Hi, welcome to Toetin Gallery in Durango, Colorado. My name is Jackson Clark and I'm the owner of the gallery. It's been in the family since 1957. My grandfather on my mother's side actually was an Indian trader in the early 1900s and later my father got involved in the Indian business in 1957. We've been in this gallery since 1983 and we're the largest Native American gallery in the state of Colorado. We also carry a nice collection of southwestern style paintings and bronzes and some wonderful, wonderful things that you'll enjoy finding at the gallery. We hope you'll come and visit us. If not in person, come to our website at toaten.com. One of the art forms that we're most proud to carry in the gallery is Pueblo pottery. The Pueblo Indians are descendants of the Anasazi who lived at Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon. In the 1400s, these people abandoned their traditional home sites and they moved to the south, ending up along the Rio Grande Valley between Taos and Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, there are many different Pueblo styles and each Pueblo developed their own, but it's based on the same basic premise that the Anasazi built their, their um, pottery with years and years ago. These look like beautiful, perfectly round, um, symmetrical vessels, and you would think they were reformed on a wheel, but they weren't. The way that they were made was so much as you used to play with Play-Doh when you were a kid, and you'd roll it out or modeling clay into long snake-like um, pieces of clay. What these people do is the same thing. They dig the clay out of the ground, they clean it, make sure that there's no impurities in it, and then they moisten it, and they'll roll it out into those long snake-like um, pieces of clay and then coil it. And as they coil it, they'll build these pots up and then those pots are shaped just by hand so that they're perfectly round and then using a stone that's been passed down by, for generations, generally, the stone is wetted and the pot is rubbed until it develops a beautiful shiny finish. Now these, um, these pieces are then painted the design that you see on the outside is done with a clay slip that's painted onto that dried piece of pottery and then it's fired under a pile of either sheep manure or pinon, um, but it's not fired to a real high tinsel so it's not going to hold water for a long time. In the old days the Anasazi would make pottery and it really didn't matter if it was going to hold water or not, they only used it for a brief period of time until it broke and then they made another one for cooking or eating or storing uh, materials. But these pieces are actually crafted as art pieces. Listen to this. That's the tinsel you get, the sound you get from a pot where she dug that out of the ground, coiled it all the way up, polished it and fired it under a pile of sheep manure and still she got that beautiful, beautiful sound to it. So there's a lot of different kinds of Pueblo pottery and each one of the villages has their own style. And at Toatin we're happy to spend our time showing you the pieces by some of the more famous artists, Margaret Tafoya, uh, Maria Martinez, uh, the Lewis family, and, and hundreds more. And we carry a wonderful selection. We hope that you'll come by and take a look. In addition to the traditional pottery that the Pueblo Indians make, they do some fun things too. One of those is the storyteller doll. Back in the 1940s, a woman named Helen Cordero came up with this idea at Cochiti Pueblo, and she had made small figurines of bears and horses and other animals before, primarily aimed at selling to the tourist market people who rode the train across and stayed at Fred Harvey's hotels. And she came up with the idea of using the clay in the traditional way, using it, building it by hand, painting it, and making these small dolls that she called storyteller dolls. And basically what they were, were women or men with small figures of babies on them, where the storyteller was telling the story, it's kind of like reading your bedtime story to your kids at night. So in different tribes began to pick that up as well. This is actually a Navajo piece by Mary Martin. And then you do some other fun things. Here you've got the, the teller, the storyteller with his traditional braids and he's telling the two kids who are 
goofing around a little bit, and on top of his head is a young baby bear listening to the tale. Storyteller dolls illustrate the creativity and the sense of humor of the Pueblo Indian potters. The Hopi Indians of northern Arizona are famous for their kachina dolls. Now these kachina dolls actually represent the dancers who participate in the kachina ceremonies. They all belong to different clans and they are in Kiva society. A kiva is a underground uh, building, generally round, that the men go down into on these ladders and they perform ceremonies and do spiritual rituals and uh, they'll dress as these different um, dolls. And when they come out, they do these dances in the village plazas and the, all of the villagers come around and watch them and if a dance is done properly, it'll bring good um, good things to the people, you know, maybe like rain or good hunting or good crops, a lot of different things. And there are hundreds of different kachina dolls and different societies that perform these dances. A few years ago, the Hopi decided to change the name of kachina to katsina. And I don't say it disrespectfully, but most of the um, carvers that we work with still call them kachinas, so I should make that clear in case somebody watches this from a tribe that wants to come back and talk to me. But they, uh, they're beautiful dolls and the interesting thing is that they've evolved so much. They used to be really, really simple. Why did they carve these dolls? Well, the reason is that the young women in the Hopi religion are not um, privy to being part of the societies going down in these kibbutz. So it's the job of the males in the society, in the Hopi villages, to teach the young girls the religion. And the way that they do that is by carving the dolls with the correct face, the correct mask, and the correct uh, costume or outfit on, and explaining to the young women what that represents. It's all a little strange because the Hopi um, society is a matrilineal society, so everything goes through the woman's side, everything except the kachina dances. Now the um, dolls are carved in different ways, some of them with a lot of musculature, some of them are real simple like the representation you see here, this tall piece, this is actually a coming out um, kachina, and it's just basically simple as a tall, tall piece with a mask that's correct. Today, what you're starting to see are these dolls that are carved entirely out of wood. They don't have, as the older ones did, the feathers and the fur and the other things. Everything is done out of one piece of wood, and it creates a really unique design. They're all carved out of um, cottonwood root. The reason they use the cottonwood is that in the desert, um, when you find a cottonwood tree, you'll generally find water, and that's one of the most precious commodities in the American Southwest. So, this is an example of a doll that's carved by a man named Dennis Ross. It's an eagle dancer kachina. It's all out of one piece of cottonwood root. Today, they use uh, wood burners, of course, to put the, the lines in the, in the wood, and they also use paints to uh, accent the, the feathers. Whereas in the old days, they would take and put leather skirts on them, or they'd put feathers on them. Uh, they put fur for the tops. And the idea is that what, what's happened, I think the Migratory Bird Act made it illegal to use certain feathers. And the, the, a lot of people thought that would be the end of Hopi kachina carving. But what the, the Hopi has proved is that they were adaptable and, and actually have made a better art form of it. These dolls are collected by many people. John Wayne uh, had a large collection he gave to the Cowboy Hall of Fame. Some of the other people that have collected these are Barry Goldwater, whose collection is in the Heard Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. But they're highly collectible pieces by artists that take an incredible amount of time and work very hard to make sure that they're exactly the way they're supposed to be. When you think of an art gallery, you generally think of paintings. And Native Americans are prolific artists, prolific painters, incredibly talented people. We carry a wide range of paintings from 
contemporary artists who've been working in the last 10 years to artists that, that have been dead for years. What we try and do, and I think it's, it's important as a gallery representing Native American art, is to try and show the evolution of the painting genre. So we start with some of the very earliest pieces that were done and um, created out of the Santa Fe Indian Art School in the early part of the century. And then we follow that through to contemporary pieces that have been done in recent times. We also carry some beautiful paintings by Anglo artists like Ross Myers, Lance Mumai, Albert Dreyer, Frank Howell, and some other people that are just outstanding and represent the Southwest. So rather than try and go through each individual artist, I'm going to tell you to look at our website or come by the gallery. And our personnel here are more than happy, just excited to spend time with you and share the stories of all of these wonderful artists. The two paintings you see in back of me were by Stanton Engelhardt. Stanton used to be the head of the art department at Fort Lewis College in Durango. He grew up in Dove Creek, Colorado and ended up going to the University of Colorado and then has lived in Durango for nearly 30 years, I think. He passed away a few years ago, but Stanton's collection of artwork was incredible. He never sold many pieces while he was alive. He kept these pieces and he would give them to people or he would sell them to you for the cost of the materials. But if he decided you didn't like it, you had to give them back to him. He was uh, in love with his painting and he would have done it if he didn't make a dime from it. He had a habit of coming in here and he'd pick up a painting and say, you know, I'm not through with that. And he'd take it home and he'd come back two or three days later and maybe have a biplane painted in it or some change in the sunset. And then a couple days later, he'd come in and say, you know, I, I think I'll take that back and change it. And so painting in Stanton's eyes was never finished. We have a great selection of his pieces, courtesy of his family, and we're really proud to represent this great American artist. One of the most interesting artists we work with is a Navajo named Leland Holliday. Now Leland was a young man at a um, young man, he was a child, at a fair in Farmington, New Mexico, and he was carving wooden toys when a folk art dealer from Farmington saw him and started to buy these, these toys from him. And uh, before Leland was out of high school, he had had um, two shows at major museums in the United States as a folk artist. And as Leland said, he wasn't really a folk artist. His parents just couldn't afford money for toys. So that's how he started doing that. He was really lucky in high school that he had a, an art teacher that stuck with him and exposed him to all different kinds of art and um, made him realize the value of studying the different types of artists that there were. He does these beautiful uh, large canvases. This buffalo is one of my favorite. It's the way he gets all of the colors, different colors that he puts together that you wouldn't normally find in a, a painting like that. And then look at the eye of that buffalo staring you down. But he's, he's got a, the ability to create these really strong, powerful figures in his um, paintings. The other thing that he does, which is really an exciting, fun thing, is he takes uh, boards, he gets these at Home Depot, believe it or not, and he, he takes, it's a, it's, a, it's a regular board, and with this board he takes and he will hand carve, he doesn't use a template or anything else, but he hand carves these designs on the board, and then he sits down and he paints them. And again, you see this incredible detail that he gets and the, the unique uh, look of all of these different colors you wouldn't normally put together. But he's a master at it. He does all kinds of animals that way. He loves to paint animals. And one of the most fun things that he's recently done, he calls these, uh, this is a, his Navajo Eagle. And he has the traditional Navajo hat, which if you don't know about the males in the Navajo tribe often used to wear these big wide brimmed hats that went all the way around with feathers on top and then he put that on top of an, an eagle, an eagle's head with the Navajo braids and then the Navajo blanket down here. But look at the difference. He's 
using his color in specific patterns here, whereas on the larger painting, he, of course, was able to spread those out and, and create his own, own color palette. But he's an incredibly disciplined artist who does a lot of wonderful things, and we hope you'll come by and check out his work. We specialize in Native American art, but we also include artists from the Southwest who um, we feel grab the spirit of the Southwest. And one of those people is Lona Warney from Farmington, New Mexico. She's an amazing artist who specializes in gourd art. These pieces are all made from gourds that are grown and then dried, and then she paints them, decorates them, turns them into sculptures, creates rattles. Pretty cool, huh? And Christmas tree ornaments. But everything that she does is carefully handcrafted, one of a kind, because as you probably can guess, every gourd is a different shape. So she takes her mental imagery, looks at that gourd, and figures out what she can do that'll make it really special. So it's been really a fun thing to have Lorna's work here. And we will find people that will come in and have never seen anything like that. And we haven't either. She's just a phenomenal artist and we're proud to have her at the gallery. Southwestern Indian tribes are synonymous with Indian jewelry. It's something that um, gets popular every 20 years or so and all of the movie stars wear it and then the rest of the time just people that have good taste wear it. But the original Indian jewelry was pretty much like this. You know, stones that were drilled, hung on, on beads of shell that were traded for. And this is the type of jewelry that you would have found the Anasazi or the early uh, ancestral Puebloans that lived in this area wearing. And today, this type of jewelry is still made by the Santa Domingo Indians in New Mexico. And at the time that the uh, Americans came into the Southwest, this was the primary type of jewelry that all of the native people wore. Many of them traded from the Santa Domingans and other people that created this type of work. Silver became a popular part of Native American jewelry in the 1865-1870 period. Navajo silversmiths began to work with coins that they melted down or that they hammered out and created these concho belts. The traders in the area were very happy about it because they wanted something that the Navajo could make that they could sell, as well as the Navajo really liked to wear jewelry. In fact, there's two things that showed the um, importance of a Navajo family. One was the amount of jewelry that they had, and the second was the number of sheep that they owned. So jewelry became really important, and this is a Navajo concho belt. Uh, contemporary one. In the old days it would have been made with hammered out silver dollars and half dollars to create the, um, the discs and then worn on, on leather straps. Well, some traders were pretty innovative about it. Don Lorenzo Hubble down at the uh, trading post at Ganado, he began to bring in, I mean really, wagon loads full of um, Mexican silver coins and he hired Mexican silversmiths to come in and they would work with the Navajos and teach them how to work that kind of jewelry. Later on they began to put turquoise in the in this jewelry and setting that with bezels required a little bit more material and a little bit more technical ability but the Navajos were really skilled at this sort of thing so you started to see these beautiful stones show up to accent these concho belts and the type of necklace that you see the that's probably the most famous is the squash blossom necklace. This is a Navajo necklace. It's made out of sterling silver and set with really beautiful pieces of natural turquoise. And this became a standard for most Navajo women is to wear a beautiful squash blossom necklace. And you also saw that um, during the 70s and 80s a lot of movie stars wearing those on late night shows like Letterman. The original squash blossoms were made just like um, in that same basic style, but they were just primarily silver with a few accents of turquoise stones at the bottom. But it's a beautiful style of necklace, and just to show you how it changed with each tribe, this is a uh, 
a piece from Zuni Pueblo, and this was made, oh, the 1930s or so. But you can see that rather than having a single stone, the Zuni people used multiple stones to create these patterns. And it's called a petty point necklace. Again, it's all really nice turquoise. Today, the Pueblo Indians, Navajo Indians, everybody has access to some of the greatest materials in the world. They can, they can work with diamonds if they want. They can work with lapis from Afghanistan or coral from the Mediterranean. This is a Zuni piece. It's made of, called inlay material. What they did is they create little boxes of silver and then inlay the shell is the white, the blue turquoise, the red coral, and the black is a uh, jet material. And it created on this particular piece a sun face design. So there's a multiple, um, you know, these people are really talented. And they can do just about anything with jewelry that anybody else can, but what they are able to do is to convey that native feeling for, um, for the pieces that they make. And we carry a wide range of jewelry from all of the southwestern tribes, including the Zuni, the Navajo, the Hopi, the Santa Domingo, and just about anything a person would want, from earrings to rings to bracelets to keychains to uh, belt buckles to bolo ties. So. Um, we hope you come by and take a look at some of the things we have. The Navajo started weaving wearing blankets 300 years ago after the Spanish arrived with sheep. You couldn't weave a Navajo rug without wool. Um, the original blankets were pretty simple with stripes, a little bit of color, not a whole lot, but they were designed to be worn over the shoulder and were highly valued by other Native American tribes around the Southwest. And as you can see, they look a whole lot better on a person than they do on a wall or a floor. The Navajo people were imprisoned at a place called Bosque Redondo over in eastern New Mexico. And during that time period, they began to adopt the white person's dress, the blue jeans, the Pendleton blankets. And it um, became clear that the Navajo wearing blanket was not a long time to be in the future. Ultimately, what happened is the Navajos returned to their reservation in um, New Mexico and Arizona. And when they got there, they found trading posts because during the time period of the war, the traders had established these posts to deal with the Navajo uh, people, Navajo trade. And they were grocery stores. You know, they, they carried pots and pans and they bought, sold sheep and sold cloth and things like that, groceries. But um, they found out the Navajo people had no money, right? So what do you do? You have to create something that can make some, make some cash that the trader can make some money on and the Navajo people can survive on. And what they did is they decided to work with the Navajo people to create the Navajo rug. What they did is they said, these people have a great skill of weaving. Let's convert that into a skill of weaving for the floor rather than for the body. And so they began to encourage the use of borders around the edge of these, these weavings. This is a piece that was made in the 1920s at a place called Crystal, New Mexico. They have woven a little bit heavier and thicker so they would wear well on the floor. And they became very popular in eastern, eastern uh, parlors and for tourists coming across the southwest. And there aren't many people who had grandparents that traveled across the the Southwest on the uh, train and stopped at a Harvey Hotel that didn't end up with a nice Navajo rug to take home as a souvenir. It continued to get better and better and more and more popular and what happened is that each trading post began to develop its own style of weaving. At the <clears throat> Two Gray Hills trading post, which is probably the most famous of all the Navajo posts, the traders there like the natural browns, grays, blacks, and whites. And so they encourage the weavers to weave patterns with those colors. There's no dye in this weaving. It's all the natural wool color from the sheep. So the woman had her own sheep. She carded the wool. She spun the wool. She cleaned the wool. Then she um, separated the different fibers and wove these, these beautiful rugs. At another training post down south <coughs> in Ganado, Arizona, John Lorenzo Hubble 
liked red, gray, black, and white, and he encouraged the weavers to weave with those colors. In fact, it was said that he would buy any kind of rug that he brought in as long as it was red, gray, black, and white. But the Ganado rub became, uh, a Ganado red Navajo weaving became the uh, staple for that particular area. Sometimes people ask about the Navajo weavings that were woven with vegetal dyes or plant dyes. Well, that never really happened until the 1930s and 40s when a woman named Mrs. Lippincott, Sally Lippincott, bought the Wide Ruins Trading Post and began to encourage the weavers to use those beautiful vegetal dyes. So the, around Wide Ruins and Chin Lee and other close by trading posts, this style began to evolve. Around the Shiprock area, the traders said, why don't you take some of the figures that you use in your healing sand paintings and put those into a rug? And these figures are called yeas, which means deity or god in Navajo. And they began to put those on rugs and created the ye pattern, which is really popular um, for tourists at that time. And it was primarily woven in the Shiprock area. Other weavers today are reaching out and doing entirely different things creating pictorial designs based on sort of the Grandma Moses motif, or you have weavers that are stepping out and creating these absolutely beautiful contemporary pieces because today they don't have to go to a trading post. In fact, most of the trading posts are gone, and they can come from Ganado, Arizona to Durango, Colorado and sell their rugs to us or to anybody else who wants to buy them. The, um, People ask me a lot of times who our favorite weavers are, and it's hard to say, but there is a woman, this lady is 94 years old, and Navajo weavers are an average at least 50 years old, so there aren't a lot of them in the younger end of the category. But when you have a woman that's 94 and can weave a beautiful piece like this, you have to be really, really proud to be part of promoting that art form. So. We carry a lot of Navajo weavings where you have probably more Navajo weavings than any other gallery or store in the United States. And we'd love to go through them with you and answer questions. Be sure and visit our website if you'd like to get an overview of all of those. One of the oldest art forms in the Southwest is basketry. In fact, basket makers occupied this area before the Anasazi built Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon. Well, the baskets that are made in the Southwest are made from indigenous materials, yucca, uh, willow, bear claw, all, anything that you can find that you can split up and make into long reeds and long, long shoots that you can weave in and out of the baskets. You may not know this, but a basket is one of the only things that can't be made by a machine. Even the baskets you buy in a flower shop are made by somebody somewhere by hand. Well, these are pieces that are made by hand, hours and hours of hard work, dedication, creating the plants, getting them ready, dyeing them, making the material correct. Sometimes in a Hopi basket, like uh, one of these really beautiful coil baskets, this woman had to pick the yucca shoots at one time, pick the grass that's on the inside that found makes the foundation at a different time, pick the plants that makes the dyes to color these different baskets or different shades in the basket at a different time. So it's like a year-round process that takes, um, you know, seven, eight, nine months and then over the rest of the period the person can weave the actual basket. These um, baskets come from the Apache tribe, the Navajo tribe, this is a Yavapai Apache piece. We have uh, baskets from the Navajo Nation. This is a ceremonial basket that the Navajos use in their ceremonies. And what's one of the only uh, tribes that's actually using these things in traditional ceremonies still today? It's kind of an interesting thing. It has a sort of a spirit line that comes from the center to the outside that allows blessings to come out. And a Navajo medicine man, when he's performing a ceremony in a hogan, is required to have this point to the east all of the time. Now, a lot of times this thing, this basket, would be filled with cornmeal that's used in the blessing. And this is actually a basket that's been used in some ceremonies, and you can see the little pieces of cornmeal inside. 
But what he has, has to do is to keep that, that spirit line pointed to the east is there's a, um, a reed that comes around and it always finishes right at the top of that. So by putting his hand on that, he can rotate the basket to keep it pointed towards the door in the hogan that faces to the east. So you can see the cornmeal that's still in the back part of the basket. We carry baskets from California tribes, from Arizona tribes, New Mexico tribes, and most baskets today are going to be antique baskets or older baskets. Some of the tribes simply don't make them anymore, so we have to get those from collections whenever we can. The Navajo and the Hopi and the uh, Tohono Odom still make uh, real nice baskets that we're pleased to have. But I hope you'll stop by and take a look at some of these. It really is amazing. If you look at a basket, it looks like a real simple thing, but if you sit there and look at it closely and see all the detail, all of the stitches, all the work that went into it, it gives you a much greater appreciation for the art form. One of the artists that we are particularly proud to have in the gallery is Kevin McCarthy. Kevin is one of the top Western art Native American themed bronze artists in the United States, in fact in the world. You can see that the work that he does is beautifully detailed. You can see the beadwork on the bonnet above. You can see the, the brass tacks on the leather uh, knife sheath. Every detail that he does when he creates a bronze is exactly as it historically should be. One of the things you notice when you look at a Kevin McCarthy bronze is the musculature of the body. And Kevin spent years and years studying anatomy. When he builds a bronze, he starts with a frame that is consistent of metal rods that are in the place of the bones. And then he slowly builds the muscles on top of that, adding the skin on top of that. So when you see a Kevin McCarthy bronze, that muscle is exactly the way it should be on a real person. He, he, this piece is called Cheyenne Thread, and he primarily focuses on depictions of Native Americans in his, in his work, and that's why we include him in our Native American Art Gallery. He also painted the painting that's in back of the bronze, which is kind of an interesting thing, too. His father, Frank McCarthy, was a world-renowned Western art painter. So, it's a pleasure to have somebody like Kevin in the gallery. He puts a little step up for us.